there. Is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So welcome to church. Well, good morning. Welcome. My name's Stephen. I'm one of the pastors here. We're really happy that you're here with us at Vineyard Church of Hopkinton, worshiping with us today. Today, we're starting a new series that we're calling Our Mess, His Message. And we're looking at the book of 1 Corinthians. We're going to go through it over the next six or seven weeks. And Sarah is starting us off today. You know, one of my favorite verses from the entire Bible is in 1 Corinthians. And let me read it for you. Verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 18 says this. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are headed for destruction. But for we who are being saved, it is the very power of God. The cross. It is so central in all of this. And maybe you're not quite sure what I'm talking about there. I'm talking about Jesus dying on the cross. But if you're still not quite sure what I'm getting at, well, here's the good news. Sarah is going to open this up for you. And then we're going to keep talking about this idea of the reality that we are broken and we need Jesus. But he did something so that we could be connected with him. He gave us an answer. So that's where we're going this morning. This week, we're starting also our small groups, and we want you to be a part of our small groups. So I want to invite you to join one, check one out, visit one. But before I go any farther, we had a conversation. Rob, our lead pastor, Sarah, and I all had a conversation about the small groups that we have, uh, why we do small groups, and what's going to be going on. And I want you to check this out. Thanks again for joining us. Now, let's listen in. Okay, well, I have Sarah and Rob here with me, and we we are going to talk about small groups. Uh, we love small groups at Vineyard Hopkinton, and we're excited about the fall when they kick off. Uh, it's a great time of year around here. Uh, last year, we had maybe the funkiest small group season that we've ever had. <laughs> we started with all in person, and then we ended all online. Uh, this year, we're trying to be a little bit more even uh, as we go along, so we're going to have some of both uh, going on, but uh, it's going to be a good year in our small groups. Uh, Rob, why do, we, why do we do small groups? Why do we care about them so much here? Well, basically, this is not our idea. It's actually Jesus's idea. So right there, it's a big idea. But uh, Jesus knew that for discipleship uh, required personal attention and growth in community. So we want to be loved. We want to learn. And uh, we do that in small groups. All of our small groups start and end uh, at the same time, which we do on purpose, even much to the chagrin of our leaders sometimes. <laughs> yes. When they get going, we tell them that they have to stop. Uh, but we do that on purpose so that you can join. Uh, we do that because we want to create gaps where new people can join groups and not feel awkward about coming into something that's been going for a long time. So that's why we're doing it right now. Every fall, we do it this way. Um, but Sarah, what are some of the groups that we have going on this fall? Mm -hmm. You know, we've got some great groups um, and so many to choose from. I really think that um, whatever your needs are, wherever you find yourself in life, um, there are other people like that uh, in this church, and it's just a great way to plug in. Um, so we've got like peace, 
uh, ministry is the peace group that really is focused on um, families with special needs. We've got a couple of really good women's groups uh, going. So you've got your options if you're a woman. Um, we've got a good men's breakfast, stuff like that. I haven't been to that. I can't tell um, how that one is. <laughs> um, but um, just great, great options. I'm leading a Bible study on the book of Revelation. So um, a very misunderstood book. I'm super excited about digging into, um, you know, discovering um, what that that looks like. Um, That's great. Uh, Rob, so Sarah's doing the uh, the deep dive. I hear you're doing a uh, great Bible study for people who are a little bit more uh, wanting to figure out how to read the Bible well. Yeah, so I want to do for exactly that, for folks that are new to the Bible, because it's absolutely vital that we get some understanding of the Bible so that we can know who Jesus is, so that we can experience Jesus' love and his plan for us. But the Bible is actually a little bit of a complicated book because it's an ancient text and we can't just pick it up like we pick up any other book. So it's kind of like the Bible for dummies or Bible for beginners or somebody that's never read through the Bible but has actually been around for a while. It's an easy place to ask any question where you don't feel silly because you don't know all the facts. That's awesome. Whether you want to learn about how the world's going to end with Sarah or <laughs> what the Bible's actually about with Rob, uh, or if you need uh, support uh, with peace or divorce care, or you're a woman and you want to hang out, or you're a guy and you just like to eat breakfast and listen to other guys talk, uh, we have you covered. Uh, so go to vineyardhopkinton.org slash life dash group and uh, check out our groups. Sign up for one. You're allowed to visit and not come back. That's fair game. We want you to find one that fits you. So check them out. Figure out where you can really get connected and be a part of community this fall. We're excited for what's going to happen, what GS is going to do in our group. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, written to a church community that Paul knew really well. Corinth was a major port city in the ancient world and had lots of temples to Greek and Roman gods. It was a big economic center. And so Paul strategically came here as a missionary. He spent a year and a half there getting to know people, talking to them about Jesus. And a whole bunch of people became followers of Jesus and formed a church community. You can read about all of this in Acts chapter 18. So after a while, Paul moved on to start churches in other cities, and he started getting reports that things were not going well at all back at the church in Corinth. It was plagued by all kinds of problems. And that's why he wrote this letter. It's broken up into five main parts, along with a final greeting. And these five sections correspond to five main problems that Paul is addressing. And so the letter reads like a collection of short essays on different topics, but there are these core ideas that unite all of the pieces together. So here's what he does in each section. He describes the problem, but then he always responds to that problem with some part of the story of the gospel, which is the good news about Jesus. And he shows how they're actually not living out what they say they believe. And so this letter is all about learning to think about every area of life through the lens of the gospel. The gospel is not just moral advice or a recipe for private spirituality. It's an announcement about Jesus that opens up a whole new reality. And that's what 1 Corinthians is all about, seeing every part of life through the lens of that gospel. Hi, my name's Sarah. I'm one of the pastors here. Question for you. What do you tell people who are really messing up? What do you tell people when they are going down the wrong path? You're like, stop, mayday, you know? Are you the kind of person who, like, goes to them very direct, tells them, um, you know, passive t tweets? Uh, are you the type who just, like, stands back, you know, just lets them learn from their own mistakes? What do you tell people who are really messing up? Uh, a number of years ago, I just moved. Um, is new to the town, a, a smaller, a smaller city, and I didn't have much money. And I wanted to get my hair cut. And I told a couple of people, like, yeah, I'm, I have this new style. I'm excited about getting this new style. I said, yeah, I'm just gonna go to the the, the great cuts down, you know, by by the grocery store. You know, haircuts can be expensive when you, you know you're you're establishing yourself. And um, 
No one said anything to me. No one said a word to me about my choices. And you know, I should have, it should have been a clue to me when uh, I went in and uh, I was the only person in a chair who was not a 12 year old boy. I came out with a mullet. It was not even a tapered mullet. It was like a shelf mullet. The, the uh, length in the front was a dramatically different length than in the back. I just, I asked for a stylish, like I just don't even know what happened. But everyone said, hmm, okay, yep, have fun with this. And didn't tell me that it was a spot for, I mean, it seemed to max out a 13 year old Boys, no one told me. Ah, <sighs> well, what do you tell people who are messing up? Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, a letter in the Bible. St. Paul is writing to a church that is messing up, like big time messing up. You should feel kind of glad that our church, uh, kind of like low-key glad that our church does not have the problems that this church does. Churches have problems. Our church has problems. Look at the church in America worldwide. We have lots of problems. These guys, they, they really have lots of problems. We can take a little bit of comfort in this. So St. Paul, what does he tell this church that he started, that he founded, and that is going through bad stuff? Well, you know what? He tells them that the solution is found in Jesus, that there, there's a solution of reorientation for how they were messing up, and it's all found in Jesus. Uh, this church, their big problem was fighting and divisions, lots of bickering, lots of cliques, lots of uh, groupings and superiorities in this way versus, versus that way. What did St. Paul tell them? What did he tell them? He told them that the, the death and resurrection of Jesus. He says, look to that. Look to what Jesus can do, not what uh, you guys can do, not what human leaders can do. Look to God. God's big act on our behalf, Jesus' death and, and resurrection, will heal our divisions. People divide God unifies. People divide. It's just fairly normal to, to categorize. You know, it's not great human behavior, but normal. God unifies. He joins us in our mess and brings us together with himself and with each other. Paul says that the cross, Jesus is dying for us, is the antidote to divisions and fights God's sacrifice for us, his overcoming of evil and injustice and oppression on the cross radically reorients and changes us. That's what Paul says to people who are really messing up. He says, focus on Jesus. We're in a new sermon series uh, called Our Mess, His Message. I'm just so excited about it. It's looking at 1 Corinthians. I think it's extremely relevant, pertinent, applicable to what we are going through. It's written to a church 2,000 years ago, but it speaks so much to us today. So let's pray and then we're going to jump into our passage together. Wherever you are, if you want to take a couple of deep breaths, just open your uh, heart and your mind to the Spirit of God. Jesus, we give you our, our intellect, we give you our emotions, um, we give you who we are today, Jesus, and we ask that you would change us. Lord God, would you speak something new into our life today? We believe that you have things for us in your word. It's not just an interesting document like scrolling through New York Times articles, learning new facts, but it's going to speak to us personally. And we want that, Jesus. We want to be changed. We want to be uh, immersed in your love and your purpose and your plans for us. We want to have a hope that comes from beyond ourselves this morning. And so we look to you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. So we are going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, starting at verse 10. It says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you all be perfectly united in mind and in thought, in purpose and in plan. He's saying, come together. Because why? 
Some people from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. Quarrels is in there. There's massive fighting. The church is about to break apart at the seams. They are fighting about sexual morals, like um, what happened in that community. They have so many things. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another says, I follow Apollos. Another says, I follow Peter. Another person says, well, oh yeah, well, I follow Christ. Take that. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized into the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptize any of you when I was with you, except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say you were baptized into my name. Paul says like, listen, I haven't done that much for you. Jesus has done everything for you. I didn't come to like baptize and start like church organizations. But then as he writes to these people, he's careful. And so he, he thinks about it. Um, Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. It's not how good I speak. I just, it's all about Jesus, not about the preacher, not about Paul, Apollos, Peter, any of those who were amazing uh, leaders in the early church. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where's the wise? Where's the teacher of the law? Where's the philosopher of this time? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews want a, want a sign and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, no matter what you're looking for. If you're looking for amazing, miraculous signs, if you're looking for wisdom, it's all found in Jesus both Jews and Greeks, we preach Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. He's saying, listen, it is just all about Jesus, and we have big ideas and, and great-sounding intellectual arguments. It's all about Jesus. And then he gets really personal. Chapter 2. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or, or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony of God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and you know, fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power. So that your faith would not rest on human wisdom or preacher or leader, but on God's power. For I resolved, I was determined to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul is all about just the simple gospel of what Jesus has done for us. And Paul thinks he knows that this will solve the problems of the church's uh, infighting and, and their divisions. And that's really Paul's number one concern, that they've been creating factions, that they think that some of them are like better Christians than, than others, and they appeal to, to Paul or like, well, oh yeah, well, Paul said this, and yeah, Apollos said that to, to justify themselves. So for us today, what does, what does this speak to us today? Well, it obviously raises some questions about um, denominations. Um, maybe some of us have heard the joke about um, a man who died and he was spirited away to heaven and uh, he met St. Paul or St. Peter at the gate and St. Peter said, welcome to heaven. I'll be showing you around. They, they, they walk a short ways and come up to a, uh, a beautiful church that's filled with loud singing and clapping and they, they go in and it's you know, an amazing worship service. And St. Peter says, well, these are, these are the Pentecostals and then takes them on to, to another beautiful space spot, you know, on the shores of the lake and people are fervently praying and it's just a, a wonderful scene and, and the man enjoys that church service and then they go into a, a third spot and St. Peter's like, okay, now you have to be very quiet 
and they tiptoe up. Say, and the man's like, St. Peter, this is intriguing. Like, what's this? St. Peter's like, well, these are the evangelicals, and they think they're the only ones here, so we have to be quiet. Hmm. There's, there's just a tiny bit of truth in, in that joke sometimes. Why do we have so many churches? It is very problematic. Um, but this passage isn't about, you know, why there's so many churches down, down the street or around us in Hopkinton or Milford. It's about us. It's about whether we identify as a certain type of Christian, like, oh, I'm a Billy Graham Christian. I'm a Bill Johnson. I'm a Pope Christian. I'm a, well, I'm a John Wimber type of guy. It's about us. We're not any type of Christian except a Jesus Christian. You know, following Jesus should make us feel more united uh, to everyone. To everyone, really. You know, Jewish, Muslim, secular, a- atheist. You know, it doesn't matter. We are all just people who, who need God and have so little to bring to the table. But God loves us unconditionally. Um, you know, we don't view people with suspicion or, or superiority. Like, are they liberal? Are they conservative? Like, I don't know if we're, we're like-minded. You know, we view everyone, including our, ourselves, as wonderfully made Uh fallen, broken, complex, and dearly, dearly loved by God. That's how we view ourselves. That's how we view others. You know, we're all the same. We're all just fellow travelers. Um, is, is the cross something that, that makes us feel like, yes, we're all in the same boat. Yes, we all need mercy and, for, and forgiveness. Or is it something that makes us feel like, hmm, well, those people, I don't know where, where they stand, or are they, they Christians, or are they real Christians, or are they good Christians? You know, the cross, if we really look at the cross, it, it unifies us, um, because it is all about what God does, not about what people do. And this is what Paul is, is saying when um, he told the people who were messing up, uh, verse uh, 113, he said, was I crucified for you? Did I die for you? You know, was I raised on Easter to bring you into new life? No, neither was Apollos, neither was Peter. You know, will, will Rob die for you? Will Stephen throw himself in front of a train for you? I know, I know I won't. Um, you know, will the church save you? No, but Jesus did. What we rely on makes a huge difference church leaders are good. I'm so grateful for the church leaders who have, you know, led me well, spoken into my life, transformed me, but they don't save me. Well, what we rely on makes just all, all the difference. Um, you know, I was driving through the uh, Panera drive through I like my coffee and like getting uh, some other things, um, a bagel for the kids or whatever. And um, instead of taking out my credit card, I took out my driver's license and, and gave it to uh, the person at the Panera drive through window. And like my kids are laughing at me and the, um, the woman just looks at it and takes it back and says, uh, there you go, Sarah. And I'm like, oh, I gave you the wrong thing. Um, my driver's license is good. I, I need it to go to the Panera drive-thru. Um, my, my credit card, like what we rely on, they're both good, they're both important, um, but what we're relying on makes a huge uh, difference. The church is great. You need the church in your life. You need good pastors and leaders and, and teachers, but the church will not save you. Jesus saves us. And listen, if we expect people to be God, we are setting ourselves up for major disappointments. Um, I've been to a lot of different churches uh, in my life. Um, I think of the first church I went to, I was in college, um, just really started, you know, getting serious about following Jesus. And, um, you know, went to this great church that really taught me so much about the, the Bible and what it meant to follow God. And, um, I was one of the only, you know, like college age person. There's, you know, kids, you know, youth group, um, but, you know, no other like 19, 20 year old uh, kids there. And um, I felt really like um, out of place and, um, and no one really like talked to me or, or interacted with me. And I remember one Sunday I, I sat in the parking lot. I was like, well, I just drove in. Nobody knows what my car looks like. I could just like turn around and, and leave and no one would even know the difference. And uh, I sat in my car. I thought, 
mm, that would make it a little less like socially awkward. Um, I was like, no, like this, this church is like teaching me and giving me um, things that I really needed, but also really like not in, in other ways, but it was great in some ways and not in, in other ways. Um, but I really think that if we have a uh, misplaced trust in other people's, um, in institutions, you know, that's a burden that they're not meant to carry. Um, pastors are, you know, fellow travelers with you. And I'll say personally from personal experience, I have learned a lot from watching people who were my leaders and teachers as they're just really human and open and honest about what they struggle with and being authentic and seeing like how, you know, the things that they understand that I don't or I do that they, they don't and just they're really opening up about what their spiritual life is like. Um, you know, in seminary, they taught us the uh, like mantra again and again. They taught us, I am not the Savior, but I know who is. I'm not the Savior, but I know who is. As Christian parents, you can't save your kids, but you know who can. As Christian friends, co-workers, we can't save those around us, but we know who does. I'm not the Savior, but I know who is. And the good news is the Savior is so, so good. So, you know, we have, we need to look to Jesus and focus on Jesus. Um, but these guys, they, they had their different factions and divisions and thought that some of them were better Christians than others. But you know what was also dividing them? Being spiritual being so spiritual. Um, some of them are claiming to, you know, have certain gifts, um, spiritual giftings. And, and as we go through 1 Corinthians, we're going to talk about that a lot more. It's raised. Um, we'll talk about prophecy, teaching, uh, wisdom. Um, but Paul says there's only one standard of spirituality, and that's the cross. The cross is just a radical reorientation to, to love um, and to love in the way of a God who is self-sacrificing for us. Why is the cross such a big deal? Why do we make such a big deal about Jesus dying? When Paul says, it's just going to be the only thing I talk about. I, just, I only want to know Jesus and proclaim Jesus and him crucified. It kind of seems like something we'd like to like get over. I mean, like he did rise again. We can just focus on that part, right? Um, I know of a church there, um, you know, they're out west in a, a larger city. And um, every year for their Good Friday service, they go to somewhere where there's been a death, you know, maybe on the highway, um, you know, a, a car accident where there's a cross on the highway or maybe a shooting uh, in, in the city. And um, they, they have their Good Friday service there um, on that spot where, where blood was shed. In, in that spot, they gather out there. It's inconvenient and maybe cold or rainy or windy, but they gather on the spot where blood was shed, where people cried and the ambulance came and they, they tried to, you know, where there was death. And that's where they celebrate their service. That's where they camp out for like an hour and a half. Because Good Friday is about someone dying. Why do we make such a big deal about the cross? You know, I think there are three reasons. Number one, it's entirely God's work. God does everything in the equation. He's the one who dies. He's the one who like takes the, on this horrible task. Um, he's the one who rises to death. We don't help. We don't contribute in that. Um, number two, it's the most realistic assessment of how bad things are. Things were bad. You know. Jesus, a, a persecuted man of a, a minority religion, um, was killed in the worst possible way, unfairly, that a very broken criminal justice system. Um, but also, thirdly, it is the most hopeful outcome for humanity. In the worst that can ever possibly happen, death, there is life. It is the most hopeful outcome for humanity. The cross says that God suffers in solidarity with us and redeems us through that suffering. The whole basis of our hope is the resurrection of Jesus. Our hope is based in the fact that Jesus came back to life. We have life when we follow Jesus, but it is a crucified, bloodied, de defeated Jesus that's raised. Our hope is from the springboard of the cross. Um, 
hope in the resurrection uh, without remembering the cross leads to illusion. It, like Easter without Good Friday, just God's on my side. Everything's going to work out great. I have victory. That is an illusion. Now, remembering the cross without the hope of the resurrection that gets a, a little dark that leads to resignation when you say you know life is hard i just have to pick up my cross and, and follow jesus no matter how terrible it is good friday without easter is pretty dark and that's why we are champions of the cross. We are cheerleaders for the cross. We believe that it is effective in every way. The foundation of our hope goes deep. The, the stakes are, are dug into the like ultimate betrayal with, with Jesus. Our stakes are dug into you know maximum physical pain on the cross, are, are dug into maddening injustice and unfairness. And still, still, there's a resurrection. That the cross proclaims that there is no depth too deep from which love cannot rise us again. That there's no pain, no, no hurt, no failure, no tragedy from which Easter cannot dawn bright and glorious. And I just think that this is so helpful to us as we go through life, A, because there's a spiritual truth and a pattern and reality that we follow supernaturally of the cross and of resurrection. And also the message is, is centering. You know, very personally, uh, I think about our kids. Um, our kids are adopted. They've been with us for uh, two years, uh, living with us. Um, I think about what the gospel means for them. Um, they're doing so well. They love church. Um, you know, love praying with us, um, but what it means for them who have gone through um, so much, so many changes, so many different families and placements and uh, losses and, um, you know, moving in with us and new family. You know, I think it's good, but it's hard. It's a huge adjustment um, and so much um, for young kids to uh, undertake. Um, but I really think, actually, and I don't want to, to spiritualize you know, the, their lives, um, because there's just so much um, that goes into it. But I really think that, that following Jesus, they need, when they've been through so much, they need to pray to a God who has suffered. But also, as kids who have been through so much, they need a God who points forwards to hope and doesn't say, well, your life has been hard, but says, no, your life can be so much better when you follow me in love. I just think it's, it's integrating, it's healing. Um, and it's just, it's been really just so good for them. Um, as I look at their life and how they kind of cope and, and put everything together, I think following Jesus and following a God of the cross and of resurrection has been so good for them as kids who've gone through a lot in their young lives. So that's why we make such a big deal of the cross. And that's also why Paul says that the cross is a solution to our, our divisions, to our fighting, because we all equally need it and we all equally benefit from it. As someone once says, no one looks up at the, the starry sky at night and says, wow, I'm so amazing. In the same way, no one looks at the cross of Jesus suffering and dying for us and says, wow, I'm such a great follower of Jesus. No, you see Jesus, you're like, wow, that's a lot. You see the starry sky, you say, wow, that's a lot. Not, not me. The ground is even at the foot of the cross. We all equally need Jesus' redeeming. We all equally benefit from it as we choose to partake. The ground is even at the foot of the cross. And it really cuts off the, the pedestals that we choose to build. Um, theologian uh, Jorgen Moltmann says, as I have set the cross at the center of meaning for church and society, in a society that glorifies success and happiness and is often blind to the sufferings of others, people's eyes can be open to the truth if they remember that at the center of the Christian faith stands an unsuccessful, tormented Christ, dying and forsaken. The remembrance that God raised this crucified Christ and made him the hope of the world must lead churches to break their alliance with the powerful and enter into solidarity with the humiliated. 
know, if we follow Christ, there's just, there isn't much chasing after success or, or power. The, the cross answers the question of whether we should be better and richer and more successful and popular. It says no, Jesus wasn't. But the resurrection says that life will be glorious. We, we so often think what the cross means for us. That's what we've done you know, this, this whole time, thinking what the cross means for us. But as we end, I want to actually think what the cross means for God. Kind of flip that the, the other way. You know, um, we know the implications. We know the benefits of Jesus is dying for us. Um, but what are the implications? What are the benefits or, or contingencies of God coming and dying uh, for us? What implications does this have on God? Well, I think it means for God that he is all in. He is totally invested. He has taken all of his ships, shoved them in as, as angels in all of heaven gasps at the bold move. God is totally invested in humanity. You know, he, he, he bled red and he cried and, and screamed over you and me. That has some pretty like amazing ramifications on who God is. The ancients, the ancient philosophers like Aristotle, you know, they saw God as the ultimate human being, ultimately smart, rational, like kind of like a big brain in the sky, you know, ultimate smart being. Um, and dispassionate, that God stood by in his superior intellect and shook his head at uh, the, the folly of humanity. God was a bystander. The Christian God says that God is suffering, crying, and dying. God is not a bystander. Whatever you are going through, whether it's finances, marriage, just stress, health issues, seeking fulfillment, uh, um, relationships, whatever it is, God is not a bystander. He does not stand out and say, mm, I wish they could get their life together. God enters into all of what humanity, all of what I'm going through, all of what you are going through. God is not a bystander. So as we worship together this morning, we're so grateful for the cross, so grateful for what God has done for us. It is all about him and we get the joy of just doing life with each other. No matter our differences, great, great or small, we get to do life together and we get to focus on Jesus as God guides us and leads us. There was a moment when the lights went out when death had claimed its victory The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in history There on the cross they made for sinners For every curse his blood atoned
Well, we're not done worshiping. And in fact, we have a new song for you that I'm sure many of you have heard uh, that I'm excited to kind of premiere uh, for our online service today. So get ready for that. But before we worship, we want to take a moment and pray together. And we want to pray through this thing that we've started doing called a Vineyard Liturgy where we add to kind of the ancient creeds, like the Apostles' Creed, uh, some of our words, uh, inviting Jesus to come, inviting the Holy Spirit to come. So I want to invite you right now to pray with me uh, this prayer. The words are going to be on the screen. Feel free to read along with me or just open your hands and invite the Holy Spirit to come. So we just say, come Holy Spirit. We believe in one God who is love, the beginning of all things, and our Heavenly Father. Come, Holy Spirit, turn our hearts to God. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, who is fully God and fully human, born of the Virgin Mary, walked the earth of Galilee to heal and to teach, was crucified, suffered, died, and was buried. After three days, he rose again, appearing to many of his followers, and he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again, and his kingdom will never end. Come, Holy Spirit, show us Jesus. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the ruler of our hearts, the giver of life, and the word of truth. So we pray Come, Holy Spirit, speak to us and change us. And we believe in your church. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, the baptism of believers, life everlasting in the kingdom of God. So we say, come, Holy Spirit, fill your church. 
Amen. Well, before we worship, I want us to celebrate with somebody who was baptized at our service outside last week, a young man named Joshua who's grown up in our church. Baptism, if you don't know, is the next step that Jesus encourages us to take after we decide to follow him. It's the step of, of going under the water and saying that we're dying to ourselves, that we're dying to our sins, and that we are coming back up into new life in Jesus. So let's celebrate with Joshua together as a church. Let's watch. Lord Jesus, I just lift up to Joshua. I just thank you for this moment, Lord God. I thank you for him as a person. I thank you for the way he's developed. Lord, we just pray for your Holy Spirit, for your presence to fill him now. Lord, I just pray that this would be a powerful, impactful, meaningful time for him. Josh, I baptize you in the name of, in the, name, in the, name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Children and the 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 children and the
So good, guys. Let's pray together. Let's pray into uh, some of what we've heard in the scripture this morning. Um, any words of songs that have been speaking to you? Um, anything else in, in this service? We just, we want Jesus to make it real in our hearts. Um, to kind of spiritually change us. Um, not to just know information, um, but to integrate it into our hearts. And specifically, I want um, us to pray that following Jesus um, makes us love others more and uh, respect others more. And, um, you know, following Jesus should, should not divide us from other people, but should unify us to other people. So I want to I wanna pray into that because that's how Jesus feels about neighbors, friends, co-workers, random people at the grocery store. Um, and that's how we want to feel about neighbors, friends, co-workers, random people at the grocery store. We want to um, have a great love uh, for them um, and have our faith in Jesus be something that unites us as Christians. So let's pray. Hmm. Jesus, we thank you that you have done so much for us and we stand as grateful recipients as grateful recipients of everything you have done for us. Thank you that you left your place of comfort in the heavens, and that you came to earth, that you call us loved and chosen, that you have crowned us with an inheritance in you, Jesus, that we just can't even imagine, Lord God. We're so blessed. We're so blessed in you, Jesus. Thank you. May we receive that this morning. Just open up the posture of your heart to receive from Jesus this morning. Thank you. We receive. And Jesus, as we receive from you, Lord God, um, we just uh, repent of, we lay aside, we, we turn from, Anything, Lord God, that makes us feel, you know, better than other people because we're Christians, that makes us feel better than other Christians, um, that makes us feel like we're good Jesus followers and other people aren't. Jesus, we just want that taken away from us and like smashed on the ground. Just kind of take a moment, examine your hearts. Jesus, this morning we say, we're not good Jesus followers, but you are such a good, good God. And Jesus, you are so good to us. We love you. We worship you. We exalt you. We lift you up, Jesus. And we just want to celebrate you. Stand in your smile and your favor over us. We thank you. We praise you. We look to you. We focus on you. And we pray that all divisions in our church, in our churches, would cease. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, thank you for joining us today. We are so grateful that you're here, and we want you to get connected. Fill out our connection card online. Sign up for a small group. Become known in our community. You could still do that at home on your computer. We have lots of ways that you can connect in but we want you to be a part of what Jesus is doing here. And we're grateful for what he's doing in your life already. Have a great week and we'll see you next Sunday.